Hello students, welcome to the lecture on dividend policy and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Explain the concept of dividend policy, understand the Modigliani Miller model, discuss the factors influencing dividend policy, explain the forms of dividends, understand the types of dividend policies, explain the Walters model, define dividend policy, stability and explain the practical aspects of dividend policy. Dividend policy. Let me first tell you the meaning of the term dividend. The term dividend refers to that part of profits of a company which is distributed by the company among its shareholders. It is the reward of the shareholders for investments made by them in the shares of the company. Dividends. So, with no more ado, for the second email in the series, let's talk about a little bit about what dividends actually are. Okay? Well, dividends are the way that as a shareholder in a company, you extract income. Okay? Now, why do people buy shares? Well, there are about two or three reasons, actually. If I buy shares in a company in, in the UK, for example, I might be looking for a capital gain. So I might be looking to buy low and sell high. Not so much in this series. In this series, I'm looking for income, okay? Dividends. So that's the second type of return you can get from a share. So you can get a capital gain, you can get dividends, and there's a third return. Uh, some shares carry little perks with them. For example, one stage uh, there were Thornton's chocolates used to give you know, discounts on chocolates, popular with some people. Uh, other stages, utility companies are given discounts on utility bills and so on. I'm not so interested in that right now. So I'm going for the middle of those, income. Okay? And for beginners, for novices, dividends are the way you get income from a company. So how does that work? What does that mean? Well, first of all, there are two types. All right? Companies can offer something I'm not going to spend a lot of time on in this, in this video, a preferred dividend, or they can offer an ordinary dividend. Okay? Pref or an ord. That's the ordinary dividends we're going to be focusing, focusing on in this video as we hunt down our income winners. Okay? Preferred dividends, that's a uh, relatively uh, small part of the investing world these days, but some companies will offer a fixed dividend ahead of the dividend paid to ordinary shareholders. Okay? It's fixed because it might be, say, 6% of the outstanding what's called nominal value of those shares. All right? So in many ways, it's like the return from a bank account. But we're interested in the much bigger dividend. This is a relatively small part of most companies that even bother with dividends um, payouts these days. So we're interested in the ordinary dividends. Those are the much bigger payouts that matter to income investors. Okay? Now, who decides how much money um, a particular share will pay out as a dividend? The answer is the directors of that company. Okay? You, as a shareholder, get the chance to then vote in favour of the payment they're going to make for the year at the annual general meeting. All right? But it's the directors who determine the size of the ordinary dividend. And it's only paid out once the directors have covered other costs on behalf of the company, like interest on uh, bank loans and overdrafts, for example. So this represents the ordinary dividend, if you like, an allocation of the total profit figure that the company's made for the last financial year. So the way that could work is basically if a company makes profits of, let's say, 100 million sterling. All right, now, profits are basically what you get um, for a company over, say, 12 months, one trading period, when you compare what it's sold to what it costs to make those sales, okay? So what you've sold minus what it costs you to make those sales is profit, and the directors then make a decision. Do we keep that profit in the business and try and grow the business in future years, or do we pay it out to our shareholders, okay? And some companies are much more generous than others, and looking for income winners, we're going to be wanting to find the companies that are reliable payers of regular dividends. All right. So the directors will sit down and say, well, maybe we choose to pay 25 million out in total in the form of dividends. We're going to hand that back to shareholders. Okay? And the exact proportion that you get of that 25 million will depend on how many of the company's ordinary shares you own. Okay? If the company's issued, for argument's sake, 100 million ordinary shares and you happen to be lucky enough to own 10% uh, of them, all right, then you're going to get 10% of the total payout. 
right? And you'll normally get it in two chunks. Directors of big companies typically will pay you 50% of the annual dividend at the halfway stage, the interim stage, and they'll pay you the rest once the annual general meeting's taken place, just after the end of the financial year, once they know what the previous year's profit figure actually is. Okay? So for an income investor, dividends form a vital part of the do I want to invest in this company equation. And actually for all investors, dividends play a really key role in their long-term returns. Okay? Since 1925, countless studies have shown that around half of the total return you could have got from the American S&P 500, for example, came from dividends. Anyone who's been a FTSE 100 investor over the last decade or so will know that almost the only return they've got, because share prices haven't really done much until very, very recently, has been in the form of dividends. All right? So dividends are a crucial part of investing, and if you're picking income winners, the word dividend is going to be a fairly key part of your overall strategy. A dividend is nothing but a periodic sharing of profit by the company with its shareholders. A dividend policy is a company's approach to distributing profits back to its owners or stockholders. Once a company makes a profit, management must decide on what to do with those profits. Advantages of Stable Dividend Policy The following advantages of Stable Dividend Policy are Desire for current income. Some investors, like old persons, widows, etc., desire to get stable current income to meet their living expenses. Removes investors' uncertainty. The stable dividend policy removes uncertainty in investors' mind about dividend payment. The changes or no changes in dividends work as a source of information about firm's profitability. Additional finance. When the company wants to raise additional finance, investors would be willing to buy its shares or debentures. Limitations of stable dividend policy. The greater danger associated with a stable dividend policy is that once it is adopted by the firm, it cannot be changed without seriously affecting the company. Therefore, it is prudent that the dividend rate is fixed at a lower level so that it can be maintained even in years with reduced profits. Today we plan to answer one fundamental question. Do dividends really matter? Do they matter to shareholders? Do they matter to the market? Do they matter to analysts? And this is what we're going to discuss over the next couple of minutes. Our outcomes regarding this topic is going to be to understand the different dividend policies and how these policies impact on potential shareholder decisions, as well as to assess the impact of these policies on future and existing shareholders. These outcomes will be addressed not only in this session that we're going to be talking through, but also through doing the case study, which is linked to dividend policy within the MBA module. What is a dividend? To answer the question, do dividends really matter, we first need to understand what is a dividend. Well, a dividend is a payout of the company's profits to its shareholders. This can come in many different forms, being cash, being a split of the existing shares, but it's any value that the shareholder gets out of the company that's not capital growth. So we've actually decided to play it. This can be depicted in the picture which is on the slide. It says the shareholder has an investment, so up front we invest in a share on the stock exchange. The company then actually goes through actions and operates and profits are made. Once profits are made, the, owners of the, the, the directors of the company have a choice. They can either pay out a dividend to the shareholders or decide not to pay a dividend and keep the money inside the entity and reinvest that money into earning future potential of the company which will increase capital wealth of the shareholder. This decision of how much to pay out or how much to retain in the company is taken by the directors and that is called dividend policy. What may happen is as a shareholder, I may receive a dividend and then I have a choice. I can either go and spend that money or I can reinvest it in the business. The question is then, do dividends really matter? If I decide to reinvest that money in the business, whether the money is paid out by the actual directors who decide to pay out a dividend or I take it and go buy additional shares and then reinvest in the business,
there's no difference. The company will have the money. So whether I as the shareholder get that value by actually capital growth, which I've then reinvested in the business, or it's paid out, ultimately there'd be no effect. So you would think no dividends really don't matter. However, dividends have a significant impact on the message that they're sending to the market. It says the company's performing really well, so the directors decide to actually give that money to the shareholders to increase shareholder wealth, saying we don't need all this money in the business to actually generate future revenues. We can pay some out and still have sufficient for future projects. It also implies that there are future investment plans, so we're trying to give you capital growth, but it's okay, there's enough in the pot to pay some out. It also says we realize that today's investor doesn't just want dividends, but also wants to increase the shareholder value. And as a shareholder, I might want short-term profit taking. So a dividend policy on the current market that's worldwide is that it is actually saying that there are funds in the entity. What's the issue really? Perception is reality. So what the market actually perceives in a dividend is the reality. So the message we're sending by not paying dividends when all the other companies in the sector are paying dividends is, we actually don't have funds to pay you. As a shareholder, I might then decide to move my investment to a different share where I know I'm going to get that dividend. So investors in today's market are demanding both capital as well as dividends. It's not enough for a company just to give capital benefits. As was the case in the technology sector for many years, if you think of the IBMs and you think of the Microsofts of the world, for a very long period of time, people were happy to just have the shares, have that capital growth because share prices were rocketing, and then just to sell their shares and make a profit. Some investors actually need that dividend income, despite the fact that this is what the market of today is saying. For example, if I was a person who was retired and I needed some income and a steady stream of, of income, I might want dividends so I have that cash flow and decide not to reinvest. So it really is in today's market critical that companies do pay dividends because it's what shareholders are actually demanding. In this money article, Simon Lambert sprightly said that dividends are the unsung hero of many an investor's portfolio, which made for interesting reading because what it said is that often people take that dividend and spend it. But if you take that dividend and reinvest in capital, I think the example they used was just government gilts. Over a period of 20 years, you could almost get a 4,000% return on that actual amount that you had invested. So by just taking your dividend and reinvesting it, you can increase your capital growth. So in today's economy, dividends are now forming part of a shareholder's means to increase their capital by reinvesting those dividends that are paid out, which has become the norm. Let's take an example. If you look at United Utilities, it's the UK's largest listed water company. The OFAT ruling was that price decreases had to be implemented and capital investments had to be made by United Utilities was made on the 26th of November 2009. This is an interesting concept. If I was a shareholder of United Utilities and I heard that the company that I've invested in has to decrease the prices of sales and has to incur significant capital investment, I would be worried because it implies that I'm going to be losing out on money as the shareholder, which actually was the case. The share price then decreased when that point in time. What happened is in the past they had had a historical payout policy of of 2% growth in that dividend per annum. So they had guaranteed their shareholders a dividend of 2% in the past, which of a fixed percentage which would grow by 2% each year. What happened is with this announcement of the OFAC ruling, the market anticipated between a 20 and 25% decrease in the dividends as a result of the fact that, that United Utilities actually had to fund this investment and the decreased prices. When they finally said, in early 2010 that they will actually only be decreasing the dividend at 12.5% instead of the initial anticipated 20 to 25%, there was actually an increase in the share price, thereby reinforcing this principle of the market perception is the reality. And what people are thinking is that the share price is affected by the dividends payout and that the shareholders are definitely demanding those dividends. So it does answer that question of dividends do matter. 
How do we manage those market perceptions? Well, the first thing is to have very clear communication of what your future plans are in terms of capital investment, in terms of actually paying dividends. But then it's to actually make sure you maintain those communications and actually pay out what you say you're going to pay out. The message you send when you say initially there will be a dividend that it doesn't get paid out is that things are really rocky in this company. So it is critical to deliver on those promises. Another means of communication that companies use is that they actually say our dividend policy is X, which is a clear form of communication that shareholders can expect over the next 5 or 10 years, or at least for the next year, this is what we plan to do. The different dividend policies that companies can implement are as follows. The first one is a fixed payout percentage. This is the policy where every year you pay out a fixed percentage of the profits earned to your shareholders. Let's look at an example. If I as a company earned £100 profit and I said that my payout ratio was 5%, that would mean that I would pay out £5 as a dividend to my shareholders. This is a great policy because it's very determinable by the shareholders. They can actually see what's coming, but it also actually reflects the earnings. So if there was an increase or decrease in earnings, the dividend would reflect the performance of the entity. However, it's not a fixed amount, so shareholders can't be determined of what's coming. The second option is zero permanent payout. While this is easy, well, it's got no impact, no calculations, shareholders know exactly where they stand. However, in the current market where investors are demanding capital as well as dividends, it's imperative that you think about this policy before implementing it. Because as a shareholder, I might actually decide to move my investment to a different um, share based on the fact that I'm not getting dividends, whereas in another company I actually am. The last option is a constant or steadily increasing dividend that is paid. This isn't a percentage of profits, but rather a fixed amount of pounds or pence that a person who's a shareholder can guarantee on. So if, for example, I say that I will pay five pence to my shareholders, increasing at a growth rate of 2% per year, as the shareholder, I can know that next year, I'll at least get the five pence plus the 2%, and the year following that, and on that, on that. It remains constant, or it increases. The disadvantage of this policy is that it doesn't really reflect the performance of a company. Whether you have a good or bad year, the actual shareholders can expect a consistent dividend. This is the most commonly applied policy, which you will see in most shares that are on the stock market. But each of these policies have their own advantages and disadvantages. The question is, you need to figure out what works best for your company and what's the message you want to send to the market, what perception is out there. So let's recap. Investors today want, as well as demand, both capital and dividends on their investments in shares. And if they're not getting it, they are actually going to move. Dividends are definitely relevant and do matter. And one of the best tools to actually manage those market perceptions is to have a communicated, clear dividend policy. So yes, dividends do really matter. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Modigliani Miller Model The Modigliani Miller Theorem forms the basis for modern thinking on capital structure. The basic theorem states that in the absence of taxes, bankruptcy costs and asymmetric information and in an efficient market, the value of a firm is unaffected by how that firm is financed. It does not matter if the firm's capital is raised by issuing stock or selling debt. It does not matter what the firm's dividend policy is. The Modigliani Miller theorem is a financial theory stating that the market value of a firm is determined by its earning power and the risk of its underlying assets, and is independent of the way it chooses to finance its investments or distribute dividends. Remember. A firm can choose between three methods of financing including issuing shares, borrowing or spending profits. The theorem gets much more complicated, but the basic idea is that, under certain assumptions, it makes no difference whether a firm finances itself with debt or equity. In Financial Innovations and Market Volatility, Merton Miller explains the concept using the following analogy. Think of the firm as a gigantic tub of whole milk. The farmer can sell the whole milk as is. Or he can separate out the cream and sell it at a considerably higher price than the whole milk would bring. But, of course, 
what the farmer would have left would be skim milk with low butter fat content and that would sell for much less than whole milk. That corresponds to the levered equity. The M&M proposition says that if there were no costs of separation, the cream plus the skim milk would bring the same price as the whole milk. Factors Influencing Dividend Policy The factors which influence the dividend policy are Stability of earnings Industrial units having stability of earnings may formulate a more consistent dividend policy than those having an uneven flow of incomes because they can predict easily their savings and earnings. Age of Corporation A newly established company may require much of its earnings for expansion and plant improvement and may adopt a rigid dividend policy while on the other hand an older company can formulate a clear-cut and more consistent policy regarding dividend. Liquidity of Funds Availability of cash and sound financial position is also an important factor in dividend decisions. Extent of Share Distribution A closely held company is likely to get the assent of the shareholders for the suspension of dividend or for following a conservative dividend policy. Needs for additional capital Companies retain a part of their profits for strengthening their financial position. Trade cycles Dividend policy is adjusted according to the business oscillations. Government policies The earnings capacity of the enterprise is widely affected by the change in fiscal, industrial, labor, control and other government policies. Taxation policy High taxation reduces the earnings of the companies and consequently the rate of dividend is lowered down. Legal requirements In order to protect the interests of creditors outsiders, the Companies Act 1956 prescribes certain guidelines in respect of the distribution and payment of dividend. Past dividend rates While formulating the dividend policy, the directors must keep in mind the dividend paid in past years. Ability to borrow Well established and large firms have better access to the capital market than the new companies and may borrow funds from the external sources if there arises any need. Policy of control If the directors want to have control on company, they would not like to add new shareholders and therefore declare a dividend at low rate. Repayments of loan A company having loan indebtedness are vowed to a high rate of retention earnings unless one other arrangements are made for the redemption of debt on maturity. Time for payment of dividend It is therefore desirable to distribute dividend at a time when is least needed by the company because there are peak times as well as lean periods of expenditure. Regularity and stability in dividend payment Dividends should be paid regularly because each investor is interested in the regular payment of dividend. Forms of dividends The dividends are available in various forms. Cash dividend The payment of cash dividends to holders of shares of corporations are decided by the board. Shares dividend A stock dividend is the payment of dividends in shares to existing owners. Types of dividend policies Accordingly, dividend policies of diverse nature are available. Prominent of them are dealt with Policy of no immediate dividend Management follows a policy of paying no immediate dividend in the beginning of its life as it requires funds for growth and expansion. Regular or stable dividend policy When a company pays dividend regularly at a fixed rate, and maintains it for a considerably long time, even though the profits may fluctuate, it is set to follow regular or stable dividend policy. The benefits of stable dividend policy are, it helps in raising long-term finance, as it will enhance the prestige of the company 
the price of its shares would remain at a high level. The shareholders develop confidence in management. It makes long-term planning easier. Regular dividend plus extra dividend policy. A firm paying regular dividends would continue with its payout ratio. But when the earnings exceed the normal level, the directors would pay extra dividend in addition to the regular dividend. Irregular dividend policy. This policy is based on the management belief that dividend should be paid only when the earnings and liquid position of the firm warrant it. Regular stock dividend policy. When a firm pays dividend in the form of shares instead of cash regularly for some years continuously, it is set to follow this policy. Regular dividend plus stock dividend policy. This policy is justified when the company wants to maintain its policy of regular dividend and yet it wants to retain some part of its divisible profit with it for expansion. It wants to give benefit of its earnings to shareholders but has not enough liquidity to give full dividends in cash. Liberal dividend policy. It is a policy of distributing a major part of its earnings to its shareholders as dividend and retain a minimum amount as retained earnings. Walter's model. Professor James E. Walter argues that the choice of dividend policies almost always affect the value of the firm. His model is based on the following assumptions. Internal financing. The firm finances all investment through retained earnings, that is, debt or new equity is not issued. Constant return and cost of capital. The firm's rate of return, R, and its cost of capital, K, are constant. 100% payout or retention. All earnings are either distributed as dividends or reinvested internally immediately. Infinite time. The firm has infinite life. Valuation formula. P is equal to DIV plus EPS minus DIV R upon K where P is equal to market price per share, DIV is equal to dividend per share, EPS is equal to earnings per share, DIV minus EPS is equal to retained earnings per share, R is equal to firm's average rate of return, K is equal to firm's cost capital or capitalization rate, K is equal to firm's cost of capital or capitalization rate. Dividend policy stability. Stable dividends have a positive impact on the market price of shares. Stability of dividend means either a constant amount per share or a constant percentage of net earnings. Stable dividend payout ratio. The percentage of the profit that is paid as a dividend is called dividend payout ratio. It shows how mature the company is. The more the dividend payout ratio, the more mature is the organization. Dividend payout ratio is equal to yearly dividend per share upon earning per share or dividend payout ratio is equal to dividends upon net income. Determine dividend payout ratio. When deciding whether to invest in a particular stock, one of the factors an investor may consider is whether that stock pays a dividend, and if it does, what its dividend payout ratio is. The dividend payout ratio measures how much of the company's earnings it pays out in the form of dividends. A high dividend payout ratio means a company passes on most of its earnings in the form of dividends to investors. A lower dividend payout ratio means a company invests most of its earnings within the company, and this often is a sign that a company is growing. Find the dividend that was paid on a stock for a particular period. You can do this by looking up the quote of a stock and looking at its key statistics. This section will display past dividend amounts and dates, usually paid quarterly. Find the earnings per share of the same company for the same period. This information should be one of the statistics displayed on the main quote page for a stock, but if it is not, 
it will also be under key statistics. Divide the amount of a company's dividend by its earnings per share, and multiply the result by 100. For example, if a stock paid dividends of $3 and had earnings per share of $10, the dividend ratio for that particular stock would be 30%. Practical Aspects of Dividend Policy Recognizing the importance of dividend policy, we are discussing the factors and considerations relevant for formulating the dividend policy. Dividend Policy Two important dimensions for a firm dividend policy are the average payout ratio and how stable should be the dividend for the period of time. Funds Requirements A key factor influencing the payout ratio of a firm is its requirement for funds in the foreseeable future. This may be assessed with the help of financial forecasts prepared in the context of long-range planning. Liquidity Dividends entail cash payments. The liquidity position of the firm has a bearing on the dividend decision. Access to external sources of financing Generally, a firm which has easy access to external sources of financing may feel less constrained in its dividend decision. Shareholders' preference The preference of shareholders may influence the dividend payout of the firm. When equity shareholders have greater interest in current dividend as compared to capital gains, the firm may be inclined to follow a liberal dividend payout policy. And if equity shareholders have a strong preference for capital gains, the firm may plough back a larger proportion of its earnings. Summary Now in the end, let us summarise what we have learnt in this lecture. The term dividend refers to that part of profits of a company which is distributed by the company among its shareholders. A stock dividend is the payment of dividends in shares to existing owners. Stability of dividend means either a constant amount per share or a constant percentage of net earnings. Walter argues that the choice of dividend policies almost always affect the value of the firm.